Hi guys, welcome to another Broken People review, and despite what's going on in the world, the show's got to continue, so uh, let's get on with it. Today I'm looking at Ishtar. <coughs> this one I kind of got requested to review, actually, because I didn't buy Essen, I didn't ask for a review copy of this one, despite the fact it's Bruno Kafala, who is one of my top three designers, I probably should have. But, literally, I just decided to watch a couple of Z Garcia's reviews, and this one was one of them, and... Well, um, okay, this caught my eye, so I thought I'd just go and grab it out of my own pocket and see what's what. But I haven't heard a lot of buzz about this one. And normally with Bruno Cafale, you get quite a bit of buzz, you know, particularly with a lot of his games. But sadly, this one just didn't seem to, well, I don't know, get talked about. And maybe that's just the problem with the fact that we've got too many games in a year. And maybe it's because this one isn't a three-hour sprawling, 20-mechanic-filled Euro game, which means they don't get talked about. That seems to be the way these days. The bigger and longer the Euro game, the more it gets talked about. But, ah well. Let's see if this one, however, can meet the mark for a nice family weight game. So what exactly are you doing? Well, it's called Ishtar Gardens of Babylon. So, forget the theme. <laughs> it's an abstract game. More on that later. But this one, you are building these gardens across a map, a hexagonal map. And you have these fountains that score you different points at the end of the game. But what you're doing is you are choosing a tile from a rondelle mechanism that allows you to place flower spaces, like grass spaces, on the board and build up these gardens away from each fountain. On these grass spaces, you can place flowers. They score you points for putting your little gardener assistants in there. But while you're doing this, you're also covering up spaces that give you gems. They allow you to purchase little skills. They allow you to, you know, contribute to getting tree cards, which are effectively just a little miniature at the end of the day. But they block a space and they get you points. And of course, tree cards, artwork. And by the end of it, you essentially start off with this desert hexagonal landscape and end up with a kind of mix. <laughs> kind of more, what looks more like a golf course than a, an actual garden in a sense. You end up with a bunch of green everywhere and some trees, but of course there's still a bit of desert left around. But all you do on the turn is just go around the rondelle, choose the tile, put it down on the board, collect some gems, purchase a skill or put an assistant down if it lets you, and decide if you want to contribute some gems to a tree card. That's pretty much your turn, and subject to a couple of restrictions on where you can place the tiles, there's not much else in the game itself. Play just continues on until a couple of piles have run out on the, on the Ishtar Rondelle, and that's it. You total up points in various ways, and then the game ends. It's a pretty straightforward family game. The question is, is it worth your time and money? So let's look at it in detail. So duration-wise, this hits the mark nicely for a family weight game, particularly one if your kids are not too young, but young enough, and that's about 45 minutes to an hour, depending on the number of players you have. This game should not take you more than an hour to play, even at the four player count, and that's a pretty good length for me. You know, I want a nice, light, easy, sort of easy going game that's not too complicated, gives me enough choices, and I just want it done and dusted in an hour tops. 45 minutes to an hour is a nice length for a little game. And like I say, I mean, it's in a big box, but the game itself is not like a massive, you know, epic Euro or anything like that. It's pretty straightforward and light. And so I don't want that kind of thing to take more than 45 minutes to an hour. Now, the only slight downside is that with four players, it leads to a little bit of downtime on your turns though. Not too much. I mean, the game is still quite short, but the problem with that rondelle mechanic is that you don't really know exactly where it's going to be until the turn before you, nor do you necessarily know how the garden is going to build up in that time. So you need to have a couple of ideas in mind for your next turn, but you sometimes get that situation where, you know, until it is that person before you's turn, you can't really think about your own turn. And so you get a lot of people who might freeze up and go, oh, what if I put that there? All right, let me grab that tile and then I could go there, I could go there. Uh, should, uh, should maybe I grab that tile? And it's like, if you get those players, ah, this is going to drag a little bit. So this is definitely one that's probably better with low, less players than it is more. But I didn't find that the downtime was too bad with four players. It's just something to bear in mind. So ease of play, well, I've already kind of highlighted it occasionally, and that is that it is a very easy game to play. The, you know, the rule book in this is crystal clear. I didn't have a single problem with understanding the rules in this fairly colorful rule book that has a ton of pictorial examples. I mean, it is easy to see how to play this. There's only a slight... Like, 
five phases to a turn, you could pretty much wrap up two phases in like a step. So technically it's like two and a half phases in a, in a turn, but it's laid out very well. There's a pictorial example for how you, what the difference between a grass space, a flower space, a garden is, you know, what control means, you know, what it needs to be getting points at the end. Very straightforward, including final scoring. The only thing that I'm a little bit um, not as keen on is the setting up the game and the reference aid is on a separate sheet. Now, fair enough, we want a separate sheet for the skills, although did it really need to be this big? This seems a little bit extreme. But why is the setup for the game not in the main rulebook? That was kind of weird. And also, if you're going to do like a reference aid this big, why not just do four small ones, condense it down and let me give one to each player? Minor niggle, but I just found it a bit odd to have a separate sheet because it's just more things to have floating around the table. But can't really fault the ease of play. I mean, this is one that I'll be able to teach to all sorts of people, you know. I mean, maybe not my parents, you know. That is like the ultimate low level of gateway level I have to deal with with my parents. But I feel that most people who don't play games very often or are fairly new to gaming would be able to pick this one up in no time at all. Because it's really the only fiddly rule you have to learn is the idea of what uh, the definitions are. So garden, flower space, you know, flower bed, that kind of thing but also the restrictions on where you can place a tile, which aren't that difficult to understand, really. You just can't join two gardens together, and you can't have more than one assistant per flower bed. So with some people, I can pretty much just go anti-Carcassonne farms, and they get that instantly. But for the newest player, even then, it doesn't take that long, and I've had good success with people who are veteran gamers and completely new players alike. So with tactics and strategy, is this too lightweight to be of any fun? Not at all. Honestly, there is a decent amount of choices in here. You know, you've got a, a way to skip tiles in that rondelle in order to choose a tile you want if you spend more gems. Granted, if you haven't saved up on gems, then you're going to have less choices on your turn. But even when you take the tile, you've got this big board, you know, of all these different you know, spaces to put the tile down. And if it gives you a skill or an assistant icon on it, then it's like, oh, I could do that as well. And you can set yourself up for some pretty good combo plays, particularly if players have put down tiles and not claim them yet. Because somebody might have built a garden up inadvertently, you know, like, oh, there's a few tiles here, I just wanted these gems. Oh, good, there's a few flowers in there. Hmm. And then you go and join one up later with another tile, stick your assistant in it, and someone's already done some of the work for you. It's kind of a bit like uh, Takinoko, where the garden is a communal garden, so everybody builds it up, but you're all using the same space. And so if somebody wants to come and nick what you've done for your hard work, then great, fair play to you, do it. It's part of the game. But there's also a lot of, not necessarily player interaction, but you gotta keep an eye on what the other players are doing because you're jostling over control of these fountains for some bonus points, but then people might block you in, you know, put tiles in such a way that it's really hard for you to place another tile down. They might grab your gems, they might block you with trees so you can't put any more flower spaces around. You know, and particularly if you go for any of the scoring opportunities in the game with the skills, people know what you're after, they can try to block you. Easier with less players than it is more, but still, you know, it works fine. And the game does scale for the different player counts based on the size of the map. I also like that the game has a lot of different paths to victory. Not like massively diversifying paths here, but you could like try and control as many fountains as you can. Okay, that's points. You could have a bunch of gardens all over the place that all belong to you with four assistants. Or you could just have one giant garden with a ton of flowers in it that's just got one of your gardeners in it. You know, because it's the same, having four gardens with four flowers in it is the same as having one garden with 16 flowers in it. You're counting the flowers themselves. So are you going to have multiple gardens to cover space or are you just going to focus on one garden and make it as big and grandiose as you can? On top of that, you've also got, via that uh, skill list, some extra ways to score points along the top. So you can score for placing your gardens next to your uh, tablet stones, collecting unused gems, not even using your assistants. There's actually a way, a strategy in the game where you just collect your assistants and then leave them off the board. I've tried it. You know, you could try and focus on the tree cards. Yes, everybody's going to collect a tree or two every now and again. But maybe that's your core focus. You don't care about what's on the board, you're just trying to collect the right gems to grab the right trees. 
Um, there's one for having trees next to your garden. And there's another one for just giving you some flat points. You know, there's a lot of different little mini paths to victory that you can take, enough to make it so that the game has enough variety to warrant some repeat plays. Granted, probably not one that I would play like every time over and over again, but each time I visit it, I can go, okay, which of these paths am I going to go for based on how things are developing, and then I can adapt myself to that strategy. Now, you're probably going to want to focus on a strategy early in the game rather than later. Like, if you know you're going to go for trees, you better make certain you start investing in them. But, you know, it's nice that there's a bit, a decent amount of choice. And I've yet to try every single strategy in this game. There's quite a few in there. But there's enough to keep you entertained, I feel, you know, and enough to want to bring you back to the table. So, aesthetics, this is a, well, let me put it this way. You see this uh, little symbol there? You see that there? That's called yellow. Yellow games. Do I really need to talk about aesthetics? You good looking. It's gonna be good. <laughs> yellow games are rarely bad for aesthetics. If anything, the most dodgy looking thing is this board. Yeah, you know, where you put the rondelle tiles on and that. This kind of looks a little bit odd. But, uh, you know, minor niggles, it's covered up with tiles anyway. But you've got some decent components here with the, the tiles themselves. So these are uh, joined together to make the map. You know, you, you try and put them so that each connect, but I feel like you could just build whatever map you like and, you know, have fun with it. But easy artwork, easy to tell what gems are in what spaces, where the fountains are meant to go. Nice and straightforward, but as you can see, nice and thick as well. They're pretty sturdy. But I like everything else in here. I mean, you get an insert that works. Oh my God, you know, I can actually store this on its side and not have too much of a trouble with it. But you got some cool little colored gems, some wooden pieces, very thick player boards for your skills. Yeah, all the tiles, you know, go into their own cubby holes nice and easily with finger holes so that you can pull them out. Uh, yeah, pretty straightforward ones there. And the fountains, just little plastic pieces. It all comes together to make what is essentially a fairly, I mean, I, I particularly like these actually, the, the tree pieces, the, these nice little kind of like tree mini pieces. As soon as you start decorating the place with them, it looks very nice. It's a bit like having the Takinoko bamboo trees now that I use that analogy again. And the cards, artwork, very good. You know, you'll see better from some close-up pictures than me just going about it. But it's, it's a very pleasant looking aesthetics for the game and everything looks like it was made with quality, maybe that, that first board I showed you, but you know, everything else looks like there was good effort here. And when it's on the table, it draws the eye because people walk past and go, ooh, you know, that's nice, isn't it? Because they see the, you know, the, des the yellow of the desert, the green trees, you know, the, the various yellow flowers, the, the different color wooden meeples on there for the assistants, the fountains, white, purple, and red. They see the tree cards with all the artwork and it just builds up nicely. And one thing I like about a lot of games is that sense of progression where you start out with this blank slate and then you watch it build up in front of you. The Takinoko Garden, I'm saying I'm going to use that analogy a lot, but like city building games where you start off with nothing and then you watch the city build up. Here you watch the garden build up and it's just very nice to see. So immersion, not as much. I mean, there's certainly engagement with the other players and there's definitely a sense of you know, you kind of get sucked into the charm of it. It's one of those zen-like games that I mentioned where it's just like, this is nice, you know, I just want to de-stress, I just want to play a nice game. This is nice, yeah, this is nice. You know, it doesn't have to like blow your brain or anything. But this is definitely an abstract game at the end of the day. I mean, you take a vegetation tile, you shove it down, you collect some gems, trade them in to make trees, which is kind of what, you know, there's not really a theme here. This is a family weight abstract game through and through, but it's a charming, nice looking abstract game. It's not just wooden blocks on the board and it's not like the most boring of colors or anything. They actually at least went into some effort to give you a decent production value so that when people look at it, they don't necessarily know it's an abstract game until they've played it. But other than the theme aside, this definitely does keep you interested in the game, mainly because the duration is not that long. 45 minutes to an hour. Most people can have an attention span long enough to last 45 minutes to an hour, and the game will keep you thinking between turns. It's not like you're sitting there going, I have no idea what I'm going to be doing. No, no. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sorted, yeah. My turn, I decided on my turn literally two hours ago. Is that, no, that doesn't tend to happen. And then finally ending with uh, longevity, I had to think about that for a second. 
This one, like I say, not one that you're necessarily going to play over and over and over again in quick succession, but this is one I want to bring to the table relatively often because I know it works with just about anybody. Now, some people might argue, well, there's, you know, the, you can't necessarily plan your head with the rondelle and, you know, the tree cards that come up might be lucky for you and not, but then that's no different from any other, like, face-up display of cards in a game. It's not like it's anything new. But I like to bring this one out because it is just so quick for me to teach, so easy to play, and yet gives me a nice, charming, aesthetic feel. Now, if there's anything that gets a little bit annoying, it's possibly the scoring at the end, but... I've heard some bloggers and people I know talk about, that, oh, the scoring's a bit fiddly at the end. I personally don't find that. You get a score pad. Okay, good enough there. And what do you score for? Right, well, count up your tree cards. Easy. Uh, who's controlling what fountain? You've got to count up the flowers, but you're, doing that to, you're already doing that to score a point for each flower, and all you've got to do is just count up the yellow spots. It's not that difficult, really. Okay, it's not on a track, but it's still not exactly that fiddly. And then you've got your skills, where again, you just count up. So yes, you do have to look at the board to see how you're scoring. Like, so, so hang on, that white fountain there. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and 12. You've got one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight. I win this fountain, score, score. You get 12 for that bed, I get eight for this bed. It's not that difficult. I feel that when people say the scoring is a bit fiddly on this one, I think they're kind of, you know, it, what's the word? Going to an extreme bit too much. They're kind of overemphasizing it. Personally, I didn't find it that fiddly. I have seen a lot more fiddly scoring systems in games, particularly family weight ones. So all in all, I really do enjoy Ishtar. It's a nice, it basically does what yellow games do best. A nice, simple, lightweight, family weight game. Now, granted, maybe it's a little bit more expensive than some other family weight yellow games because you are, of course, getting a big box with lots of stuff in it. So maybe if price point is what you're afraid of, then there are cheaper ones available from yellow. But still, I think this one deserves a look. So my final word on Ishtar is that this is an underrated family weight game that deserves more attention. It's not the best family weight game out there, but it is a charming, pleasant, zen-like experience that gives you enough paths to victory for some replayability, some beautiful looking components on the table, and has enough within that hour to keep you engaged. This is definitely one that you should give a look if you are into some family weight games. I feel this one is going to fly under the radar and that kind of makes me a little sad really because I feel like it deserves a little bit more attention. Not like, the, oh my god, this is the best thing ever. We're not talking like wingspan levels of greatness here. But, you know, I feel this one deserves a look. This is what Br Bruno Kafala does best and I feel he's done another good job here. So I'm giving this one a solid 8 out of 10. You know, one that I would like to bring to the table uh, on frequent occasions. I like it. Easy to teach. You know, what more can I ask for for a entry level game? Gateway level, it's, well, I don't know. I think you could call this gateway level. I don't think it's that difficult for new players to learn, but maybe you could argue that this is kind of on that Takinoko level where it's just a smidgen above gateway level. But no, I feel a lot of people could get into Ishtar without too much trouble. So solid 8 out of 10. Give it a shot if Yellow Games, if Bruno Kafala or Family Weight Games are your thing. So until next time, I'm going to sign off. Thank you for everyone who watches the channel and subscribes to the Patreon and Facebook and Twitter. Let me know what you like to see next and let me know what you think of this game in general. Ishtar, I'd like to hear your thoughts. So regardless of whether you're stealing my fountain or gems, it's still only a game and I'll see you next time. Take care, guys. <laughs>